it's not easy to get super knock on a properly built race engine. The most common weight is uh, at the rev limiter. So the rev limiter strategy plays a big role on if you get super knock or not. Welcome to the HPA Tune In podcast. I'm Andre, your host, and in this episode, we're joined by Yanis from Plex Tuning in Greece. Now, Plex make a range of products, but really, what we're focused on during this interview is their Plex Knock Monitor. This is an audio knock detection tool. This is something that I've relied on in one form or another for my entire career tuning EFI, and it's something that I think a lot of new tuners overlook or maybe don't fully understand, and that is the propensity of an engine to knock and how quickly that knock can therefore end up damaging or even destroying the complete engine. In my opinion, with the number of engine failures I've seen over my decades in the industry, I would say knock is the primary destroyer of any performance engine. So if it's that likely that knock is going to destroy your engine, surely it's something that you want to be able to monitor and understand when it's happening. In this interview, we dive deeper into the topic of knock or abnormal combustion in general and what causes knock. We also got other terms as well that come into this, such as pre ignition uh, as well as super knock. So, we'll learn about all of those terms in detail as we go through this interview with Yanis. We'll also learn how the Plex knock monitor works and how you should be using audio knock detection in order to get the best possible results, particularly using the digital signal processing, which helps improve that signal to noise ratio removing some of the background mechanical engine noise so that you can focus specifically on the sound of when knock is occurring in your engine. Before we get into our interview though for those who have maybe been hiding under a rock and are fresh to the HPA tuned in podcast High Performance Academy is an online training school we specialize in teaching people how to tune engines build engines construct wiring harnesses we also cover race driver education race car setup 3D modeling and CAD as well well as fabrication. All of our courses are delivered via online video based modules which you can watch from anywhere in the world provided you've got an internet connection. This gives you the benefit of being able to learn from the comfort of your own place and you can learn at your own pace. You can as a podcast listener also use the coupon code PODCAST75 that'll get you $75 off the purchase of your very first HPA course and you'll find a full list of all of those courses I mentioned before at hpacademy.com forward slash courses we'll chuck a link to that in the show notes as well as that coupon code to make it really easy to find. Alright let's get into our interview with Yanis now. All right, Giannis, thank you for joining us today. Great to have you on the podcast. And as we always do, let's learn a little bit about your background and specifically how you formed an interest in cars and the automotive industry. Hello, Andrea. Thank you very much for having me. So let's say coming out of school, I always were interested in let's say, engineering, but I got interested in cars through some friends. And uh, let's say this slowly became a passion for, let's say, performance cars and tuning. Initially, what I want to do is tune my own car. And that's how most people start. Um, some of my friends uh, also had, let's say, cars that they wanted to tune. So because I was uh, very interested in engineering and I was, uh, let's say, reading about all the concepts of uh, internal combustion engines and tuning, also studying mechanical engineering at that time, uh, I had a good grasp of what needed to be done to improve the performance of the vehicle. So the first thing that I actually did was calibrate an additional injector controller for a turbo retrofit kit. At that time, that was probably in 1993 or 1994. The only controller available was one that was from a company in the UK, ERL. So they had the controller that was analog. It had the potentiometers where you could tune the starting point of the ejection, the gain, and also do RPM corrections. So it was creating kind of a 3D map for the fuel injection, so uh, you could tune the fueling uh, quite well. So that's pretty advanced for an additional injector controller back in that time? Yes, it was very advanced, and so if you did it correctly, you would get a very well 
let's say, performing uh, engine, it would also be safe. I've gone down a similar path with sort of adding an extra injector to turbocharge a naturally aspirated engine. And I've talked about it previously on the podcast, definitely um, was of a matter of not having better options as opposed to that was my preferred way of doing it. Obviously, tuned well, and it sounds like your auxiliary injector controller did have the ability to do a good job. Tuned well, you're going to get great control over your fueling, but of course when you start adding boost, the fuel is only one element of, of the tuning. How are you dealing with the ignition timing, which would argue is, is probably equally, if not more important than getting the air fuel ratio correct? Yes, so at that time there were a few already turbocharged engines, so OEM turbo engines. So for those engines, Usually they had some um, margin where you could increase the boost and maybe add a little more fuel without running into problems with the the donation. For engines that were previously naturally aspirated, what people would usually do is they would lower the compression ratio and this would give them, let's say, enough phase until going into the donation when they added boost. So essentially allowing you to run a little bit of boost on a naturally aspirated timing map while still not running you into into detonation. Yes. It's a band-aid, but it works. Yes, it's it's a band-aid, yes, but it was, let's say, it was kind of primitive. Well, we're talking about simpler times as well, aren't we? Yes, yes, state of the art at that time. Yes. <laughs> Uh, out of interest, I mean, obviously people at this point, you know, four minutes into the podcast have probably picked up, you've got a bit of an accent here. So let's talk uh, briefly about that. I know where you're from, but for the listeners, whereabouts are you based in the world? I'm based in Athens, Greece. Okay, perfect. And I'm interested because obviously the, the cars we've got access to all around the world are very different. I live in New Zealand where we're very predominantly Japanese domestic market orientated. So that's kind of what I grew up with in sort of honed my skills on what have you got access to there you're talking about turbocharging these naturally aspirated engines what specifically at that time they were mostly european cars so a a few japanese but at that time not the let's say the higher end performance japanese cars so we we wouldn't have those but going back to what we were discussing before so this issue with the ignition timing led to the next step So it became evident that we needed to modify the ignition timing at some point to get better performance or uh, safer performance. So my next step was to get the tools needed to be able to calibrate the OEM ECUs, so chip tuning tools. So at that time, again, things were very primitive. So you had to actually remove the chip, the main memory chip from the ECU you would, uh, let's say, erase it or replace it with another chip and with uh, changed values. But the function of the ECUs were, was much simpler. There was, let's say, one ignition map. So with the correct tools, it was not very difficult to do what you needed. And this provided the ability to have more boost or stay out of the donation for higher power. So you're essentially able to then recalibrate that factory ECU much like the OE calibrators would be doing, but of course, you know, with a more performance orientated tune in mind. I'm interested, just talking about the the time frame, you you mentioned sort of early to mid 90s. It's probably similar to, to when I was sort of getting involved as well. Back then we had access to, I mean, both European and JDM, US domestic market, it doesn't really matter. They're all very primitive, I would say, compared to today's modern ECUs. One of the elements there is there wasn't a lot of interconnectivity in the cars of that era with CAN bus communications between various electronic modules. So there was a, it was back then relatively straightforward to remove a factory ECU and use an aftermarket standalone, be that a wire in, or we were lucky with a lot of the popular cars, there were a number of manufacturers that developed plug and play ECUs, which you know, literally it couldn't be easier to, to add tunability. I'm interested, was that not available for the models you were dealing with, or you know, why did you go the route of chip tuning? Yes, this is kind of early for that. So this is, uh, let's say, the era where you had the first appearance of the Motecam 4 
Uh, there was a um, UK company, DTA, that had their first ECU. You had the first Haltec ECUs. But I think at that time, there were not, let's say, plug-in kits uh, available. And also it was, let's say, maybe an expensive option to add this kind of uh, ECUs. But there were um, vehicles with aftermarket ECUs that I started calibrating. And initially, there was those Moltec and DTA that I just mentioned. One issue at that time, early time, is there were no wind band lambda meters available, or there were, but they were They're very expensive. Yes, yes, you had something like at that time. Let's say you needed uh, four or five thousand dollars, let's say, to get a lab grade lambda meter. So we had to um, use a narrow band lambda sensors, and you can get a ballpark figure out of them. So is it rich enough? <laughs> so <laughs> something like that. I, I went through exactly the same experience in my early days of tuning, exactly the same. There the were no wideband controllers you know, cheaply available, and certainly the four or $5,000 entry fee was, was way beyond what I had available. So yeah, I, like you, I was using the narrowband, and you quickly realize the limitations of the narrowband sensor in terms of looking at the voltage it's outputting. It's been so long that I've forgotten what I was even targeting now. But then it also becomes very sensitive to temperature. So I seem to recall issues if you're doing repeated hard pulls, you would build too much temperature in the in the sensor. And likewise, if the sensor was cold, you know, there's a lot of challenges which current crop of tuners coming through these days will never know, <laughs> never, never ever experience and never have to worry about. But I also look back to those days and I mean, you know, we had ECUs that didn't even compensate for injector dead time. That wasn't even known to some of these ECU manufacturers. We had no closed loop knock control. We had no closed loop wideband lambda control. And yet we still managed to produce reliable tunes that were consistent and powerful. So, you know, the, the technology that we've got available today, which we're going to dive into with some of your products as we go, is only making it easier for the current crop of tuners, I believe. Sorry, I, I went off on a little bit of a tangent there, but I'll, I'll let you get back. Yes, certainly. So the first, let's say, electronic product I ever designed was a lambda meter. So it was just like those, let's say, multiple LEDs that you see to indicate that uh, get the voltage, and depending on the voltage, you enable an LED to determine the air fuel ratio. So that was kind of the first product that I designed. So you're, you're talking about just an array of LEDs, not a specific yes. air fuel ratio. So it wasn't actually displaying you know, 14.7 to 1. It was just an no. LED at no, no, 14.7 no. to 1 and then rich or lean at that point. Yes, yes. We would use this on customer cars so that they would know if it was running lean for some reason so they would not destroy the engine. Is it safe to assume that that product was still utilizing the narrowband sensor? Only the narrowband sensor, yes. In the following years, there was a very, let's say, rise in the demand of these turbo retrofits, so converting naturally aspirated turbo engines. And at some point, I got fed up with this uh, additional fuel injector controller because it was not precise enough. You see? So I decided to design my own. So that was the second uh, product I designed was a fuel injector controller, uh, which was fully digital. Uh, initially, you would calibrate it with a separate controller that had a display, an LCD display, where you would input the values similar to the first Link ECUs. And following the iterations of that had a PC software which you would use for the calibration. And it had a 3D map, so it was like a small ECU only for fueling. Uh, at some point, I also had some auxiliary outputs that I would use to control, for example, water injection, or I would use it to um, it pass through uh, sensor voltages that were going to the ECU to prevent it, it from going into fuel cut. I don't know if you remember the HKS fuel cut defender. So I, I had this like, functionality built in. So you could basically cap the MAP or uh, MAF sensor output into the ECU. So the ECU thought everything was just going, going fine, but uh, you were off the map sensors chart basically. Yes, you wouldn't trigger an error in the ECU this way. Yeah, you're taking me back to a very dark time in my own tuning background. <laughs> I'm glad things have moved on from there. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about the, the, the link here. You, you sort of mentioned obviously the, the sort of passion for cars and sort of you know getting your hands dirty, developing the skills around tuning. 
but at the same time you sort of mentioned a mechanical engineering direction with your your schooling yes that's what i was studying but i was also interested in electronics and these products i started designing was just by let's say research and trial and error so there's no formal qualification path giving you these skills to to become an electronics engineer you're, you're basically learning as you go okay yeah yes i i, I learned it as uh, as i went looking back <laughs> I, I can see that uh, i could have done better but at that time i don't really know if i could so without without let's say formal uh, education or guidance I mean, there's an element, of course, with everything that you simply don't know what you don't know. And uh, yeah, th there's a learning curve you have to go through. And of course, and we'll get to this near the end of the podcast. Often when you look back, there's some glaring omissions you may have made or some other routes that you could have taken that, that might have got a, a, a different result or the same result quicker. But, you know. It's always easy, Every, as they say, uh, hindsight's always twenty twenty. So I don't think there's too much point dwelling on that. Let's uh, let's continue looking forward. All right. So in in terms of your skill set, we've got a, a bit of an idea of where that's going with a, a tuning skill set, knowledge on tuning. Obviously, it sounds like you're starting to see holes in the tuning market for tools or products that would allow you at least to do your job better. And I'm guessing you felt if, if you can use these tools to do a better job, there's probably a market wider around the world for the same tools. At what point did, did this sort of lead to Plex tuning or have we still got a, a fair bit of a gap there in your career before that happens? Yes, the, there is a big gap because after these uh, fuel injector controllers, there was a, a large period probably around, let's say, from 97 until the first Plex product was uh, almost 2010. So in these years, I was very focused on uh, calibrating ECUs, OEM and aftermarket. Initially, I worked at, as a freelancer, let's say helping different workshops and uh, race teams and using several dyno facilities that were available. Uh, at some point, I was in a collaboration with dyno facility uh, and use, uh, let's say, a permanent location for tuning. They had the Dynapack dynamometer, and they were also very involved in rallying. So it was a Toyota dealership that also was involved in um, racing. And this gave me the opportunity to work also on, very, on a lot of uh, race vehicles. And uh, a few years after following that, I decided to let's say, start my own facility and own company. And it took another few years until I started developing products again. So there's a large gap between let's say maybe 1997 and almost 2010 let's say more than 10 years where i was not involved at all in um, product development okay so over that 13 years or thereabouts you you're obviously sort of honing your skills and you know learning on a, a wide variety of vehicles by the sounds of things what tools were you as a tuner what did you feel that you were lacking what would have made your job easier Yes, so wide band air fuel ratio meters became available at a say, normal cost, so that was not an issue. Uh, knock detection became the issue. Power levels continued to rise. So at some point, 200 horsepower was, let's say, a high power level. Then it got to 400, 500, 600, 800. And so it became more difficult and let's say more dangerous uh, to tune. I was using tools like many people probably have uh, tried, like a tube connected to the engine directly going into headphones. So just carrying the sound of the engine to not headphones close to your ear. We would look at spark plugs. I also had an electronic system which had kind of a microphone that you would attach to the engine, but without any actual filtering, but it made it a little easier when the car was allowed to listen to the engine. So these were the tools that I would use and other people would use to try and detect knock, but we would have to play it safe, uh, let's say most of the time. So they may be left a little bit to be desired in terms of their reliability and consistency of, of knowing that you were genuinely picking up actual knock. Yes, certainly, certainly. And this led to the, let's say, desire for an knock detection tool. 
and I researched the market and there was nothing available that I thought would suit my needs. Some aftermarket ECUs were starting to have knock detection and I tried to combine both in, let's say, acoustical detection, so detection by the operator and the kind of knock detection that aftermarket ECUs were having into one unit and designed the first knock monitor. Initially, initially, it was just as a tool for my own use. Yeah, I've, I've used one of the first generation of the Plex knock monitors, which I'm guessing that became, and, and I, I have found it to be exceptionally effective. Let's roll back a little bit before we get too deep into the knock monitor and how it functions, because I, I think before we get to that point, we probably need a bit of a conversation on what knock is, because this is an area... I see so much misinformation and so much confusion about. And the other element, which which I think we'll probably dive into a little bit, is there's a generation of, of the current crop of tuners who I see comments that disturb me a little bit about the irrelevance of knock detection in general. Basically, this is, as I see it, come from a, a generation of tuners who are tuning solely on the likes of E85 or really good quality race fuel or maybe methanol fuels where knockers, I wouldn't say impossible for it to occur, but very, very unlikely compared to a shitty grade of, of 91 octane pump fuel where any turbocharged engine you can you can generate knock. And I think if these tuners actually had to tune on these low grade fuels, they would uh, really embrace knock detection wholeheartedly. So let's come back to this. First of all, before we get into knock, can you actually go through with us what happens during a normal combustion event? Because I think there's, again, a, a misconception that when the spark plug fires, that we just get an explosion inside the cylinder, like a stick of dynamite exploding, and that's it. But that's not really the case. So talk us through what actually happens. Yes, from my uh, our point of view, it might look like an explosion, but it's a control expo- explosion. So uh, when the spark fires, it initiates combustion. Let's say at the beginning, uh, the combustion is slow. So there is a phase until the combustion actually starts around the spark plug where it is, it is slower than, let's say, the normal speed of, of a combustion. When the combustion is established, you have a, a flame front that travels let's say, from the spark plug outwards towards the, the cylinder walls, burning the fuel. This happens, uh, let's say, at speed that looks very fast for us, but it's, uh, let's say, not very fast in combustion terms. It's a controlled uh, burn uh, that leads into a normal, let's say, controlled pressure rise in uh, the cylinder. When you have knock, uh, what usually happens is the following. So knock usually is what we call end gases self-ignition. So when this flame front is tra- starting to travel from the spark plug outwards, uh, at the time that it is traveling, it is raising the heat and the pressure of the rest of the combustion chamber. So at some point, part of the air fuel mixture, uh, usually around the edges of the combustion chamber, self ignites, and this creates, let's say, a cascade of burning that leads into a, let's say, a very much faster burning of uh, the fuel in all of the combustion chamber. It again doesn't happen, happen instantaneously, so it's still let's say, proceeding, but at a much faster pace. This is what causes let's say, this um, faster explosion or like bang, or whatever you want to call it, causes a resonance in the combustion chamber. Uh, which is then transferred to the engine block and cylinder head, and this is what we hear uh, when we have no. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop you there because there's a bunch of of points you've made, which are all really great that I just want to expand on a little bit before we we dive too deep down this rabbit hole. So let's just come back to just to clarify a little bit with what you're talking about with the normal combustion event. You said that in terms of you know engine operation while it seems like a, an instantaneous or a very fast process f- for us, it actually happens under a relatively slow and controlled process. And I think that the point to just clarify here is, you know, when that spark occurs, it's igniting or initiating the burn at the fuel air charge 
via the spark plug and that creates this flame front so that propagates out moving out through the combustion chamber and as it moves out through the combustion chamber it ignites the unburned fuel in the air ahead of it so it's it's relatively slow for it's it's not all of the fuel in the air being consumed and igniting spontaneously it's that slow control burn as the flame front ignites that fuel in the air ahead of it and what that results in which is important for our engine operation is a relatively smooth and and controlled increase in our cylinder pressure okay so now when we come to the knock event so as you mentioned you've you've got this rising pressure and as a result of this rising pressure we've got rising heat as well the combustion events occurring so heat's being created pressure's being created and when that heat gets too great this causes these pockets of unburned fuel and air and the end gases to auto ignite spontaneously combust whatever term you want to want to sort of refer to it so I mean, my own explanation for this and you know sometimes it's a case of getting an explanation I find that is easy to understand and at least as scientifically correct as I can make it. I mentioned that under normal combustion people think that it's like a stick of dynamite exploding in the cylinder but as we've discussed now it's not, it's nice and smooth and controlled. I kind of liken that knock event though when those unburned fuel pockets, fuel and air pockets explode to almost that is a bit more like a stick of dynamite exploding. The release of the energy is much faster. Is that a, a good enough way of explaining it? Yes, it is much faster and it causes, let's say, a cascade of events. So you have the flame front and then when you have the end gases self-ignite, then this in turn also increases the pressure and the temperature in the chamber. So you have, let's say, almost all of the fuel igniting at the same time, but not exactly at the same time. It, it looks like that, but let's say there's an exponential heat release. It's not at a constant rate, so it happens uh, much faster. This is what happens with NOC. This is what you call NOC. So there's also a different type of NOC, uh, which is NOC that is called by, caused by pre-ignition. So this can happen before you have the actual combustion. If you have a hot spot in the combustion chamber, that causes air fuel mixture to self-ignite. And that can be that'll be typically much much earlier in the engine cycle during the the compression stroke. So the piston starting at the bottom of the stroke, cylinder full of unburned fuel and air. The the piston starting to move up on the compression stroke, and at some point fairly early in that stroke, that's when we can have pre ignition occur. Correct? Yes. So let me go back to the normal knock. So uh, when you have the spark ignition, this usually happens, let's say, some tens of degrees before top dead center. But because the initiation of combustion and combustion burn rate is not at a very fast speed, we actually have the peak pressure of the combustion happen after the top dead center. So after the piston has started coming down, when you have pre-ignition, because combustion starts very early and it's very rapid, you can have the maximum pressure or this, let's say, knock event. So it might be similar to the normal knock event, but it happens earlier when the piston is closer to top dead center, we have more pressure, so it becomes more violent. The pressure rise, let's say, is uh, usually much higher. Uh, when this happens at very high load, you can get what's called, let's say, a super knock event. So this super knock event, the difference is uh, between the normal knock is that it is usually caused by pre-ignition and it has a very high peak pressure, peak combustion pressure. In a normal knock event, you might have, uh, let's say, in, an increase in combustion pressure, uh, a few percent points, so 5, 10%, maybe 20%. But the super knock event can have, let's say, 150% increase in combustion pressure it can be damaging yes. very very destructive or potentially destructive to the engine yes yes it can be very destructive yeah i mean i think i've always sort of claimed i mean my background was with import drag racing where we're trying to make a stupid amount of power out of small capacity engines and the way we do that of course is to run extremely high boost pressure uh, and fa force as much air into the the cylinder as we can so this is a perfect sort of way to, to learn the downsides of, of knock or pre-ignition 
and you know you can see some pretty catastrophic failures occur very very quickly but I think there's a lot of confusion again I mentioned confusion about knock in general but I see so many people getting knock and pre-ignition confused and I hear terms like pre-detonation as well which which at least to, to my knowledge is not a thing I mean the clear distinction point for for me is really knock is occurring after the spark has already initiated normal combustion and it's a result of the the heat rise as a result of that normal combustion getting to a point where we get the spontaneous combustion. On the other point, pre-ignition occurs, as its name would imply, before the ignition event and because it's happening so much earlier in the in the combustion process or so much earlier in the, the engine cycle, it, it's actually significantly more damaging than knock. I mean, I think with our drag engines, you, know, you could you could get away with a mild amount of knock. Obviously, as the specific power level rises, the, the potential for damage increases. But you could get away with some light levels of knock, but just a few engine cycles at very, very high uh, specific power levels with pre-ignition occurring would blow the centre out of a piston. So, you know, very catastrophic and very, very quick failures. Does that sort of match your experience? Yes, and it's usually different types of failures. So the super knock many times causes, let's say, mechanical failures. So you can break a piston in two, you can bend a rod or even um, damage a bearing. So that's purely that physical load on the top of the piston crown and the components in the engine just cannot handle the amount of pressure. Yes, they, they cannot handle it. But with, let's say, regular knock, usually you first see damages on the piston. And there's a misconception, uh, let's say, why this happens. The increase in, in pressure during a normal knock event is usually not something that the engine cannot handle. That's fine. The actual problem is the following. When you have a normal combustion, which uh, the flame front proceeds at, let's say, at a normal speed, you have what's called, uh, let's say, laminar flow in the combustion chamber. A laminar flow means that depending on the actual speed of the moving gases of the combustion, uh, you have the laminar layer, which is, let's say, a layer of gas. You can think of it, uh, let's say, as sitting on top of the piston, which is stationary. And the combustion, combustion is moving, but there is a layer, so it might be half a millimeter thick, or it, it depends on the speed. We can do the calculation, so, but it has a thickness. And this uh, thickness insulates the piston from the combustion heat. When you get detonation, uh, the speed of the combustion is much higher, and this creates a much thinner laminar layer, or even it goes into turbulent uh, flow. When you have this, this, the laminar layer is stripped, so this insulating layer is not there anymore, and you get a lot more of the combustion heat transferred to the piston. And this is what causes the damage. So the combustion is not producing more heat. You have the same amount of fuel in it. And uh, it's actually producing it in, um, let's say, a shorter period. So you could say that uh, heat transfer time is smaller, but you actually get more heat transferred to the piston because the laminar layer is stripped. And uh, unfortunately, this has an effect also on the next combustion. So when you get into detonation, because your piston got hotter, it's easier to get detonation on the next cycle and on the next cycle. So this is why many times, if you have a little detonation, it will certainly go into a lot of detonation and you will damage the engine. So here's the difference between the race fuels and the normal fuels, the pump, uh, gas pump fuels. Many race fuels have, let's say, a bigger tolerance for detonation, which means that even if you get this additional heat in the combustion, from the, in the piston or the combustion chamber, it will not change a lot how much likely detonation is to happen. So you might get a little detonation, but it's not a frequent event and it will not lead to more. But with a pump fuel, this doesn't happen. So the tolerance is smaller and uh, it will lead to, let's say, cascade effect and uh, detonation runaway. 
that's usually what happens. So the the laminar layer that, as you refer to, it, I've I've always just explained that as as a boundary layer of gases. But I mean, yeah, same same. Essentially, most people could probably understand that the piston and often the cylinder head is made out of a, an alloy, aluminium alloy, and you know, that might have a melting point of I don't know, let's say seven hundred, maybe seven hundred and fifty degrees C. The combustion temperature is clearly well above that. So you know, it's reliant on that boundary layer or laminar layer to, to protect those components, the piston crown and the combustion chamber surface from that full heat of combustion, otherwise clearly they'd be melted. So when NOx starts to strip away that, that layer and allow that full heat of combustion through to the piston, what would we be looking for on, on a strip down in terms of the, the signs that detonation has been occurring? What, what would the telltale signs be? Yes, usually the first sign is, let's say, tripping of the deposits on the piston. So that's the first thing to go away. So normally you would have some, let's say, combustion deposits on the pistons, and these are stripped. If it's for a bigger duration or uh, more heat, you can have actual, let's say, pitting or, let's say, stripping of the parts of the aluminum on top of the piston. And then usually the next sign is near the edges of the piston, you will see some, let's say, heat deformation. But at this point, it is, the, the engine is gone. So there's no way to, to recover from that. And, and if you keep running it, when you take it apart, you will even have more damage. The rings will stick in the grooves. You will have lines in the cylinder wall. So many things will happen. But the first signs, if, if you catch it early, would be, let's say this stripping of the carbon deposits uh, or some stripping of uh, aluminum from the piston. And usually you can see these signs also on the spark plug. So uh, sometimes you can see, let's say, small balls of metal deposited on the spark plug. These are from the piston. So there's, there's definitely some, some signs we can look for. I mean, the spark plugs are obviously relatively easy to, to inspect by eye. You know, often a, a magnifying glass is going to help the, uh, to, to really see what's going on. Usually, I mean, this sort of gets into a little bit of the topic of spark plug reading, which is certainly not what we're we're dealing with today. But as usual, to really get clarity on this, it's it's always good for a tuning session if we are starting with a fresh plug as opposed to something that's maybe got sixty or seventy thousand miles on it and is sort of you know pretty worn and, and sooty. You know, you're not that just makes your life a lot more difficult. Uh, the other element, and I mean, probably a home enthusiast might not have access to these tools, but they are getting so much more available and cheaper. A bore scope that allows you to actually visualize what's going on on the crown of the piston. Uh, that's a, it's a really good way to to sort of formalize and validate whether you've got. Uh, knock occurring and, and hopefully catch it before it's too late and when it is too late though I, I think this is an element that sort of gets more towards the engine building side of things but it's very easy to get caught out if you pull an engine apart and you're expecting to reuse some of the components like the pistons I always spend a lot of time during the disassembly inspecting the pistons thoroughly and I'm looking for signs of a sandblasted appearance around the outside of the piston crown. Interestingly, I usually see that on the inlet side as opposed to the exhaust side, which seems counterintuitive given that obviously the heat would be more isolated around the exhaust, but that's been my experience with four valve turbo engines that I've dealt with. So that, that's the first sign. When it gets pretty serious, well, you don't have to look too hard because you probably have a, a hole lanced down through the side of the piston, which is going to make itself pretty apparent to you. But, you know, for, for something that's had moderate to, to mild detonation, the other element that you mentioned there is it will start to actually, um, how would you put it, compress the ring lands, I guess, would be a good way of explaining it. So you, your rings will no longer be free in their grooves. So, you know, it's always a good idea to just check that the rings are free. Yes, the piston is deformed from the heat yes usually when this happens yeah okay so so that sort of covers our, our levels of damage that we could expect with detonation knock uh, you also mentioned mechanical failure as a result of, result of super knock because of the uh, intensely high cylinder pressure what is the difference if any in terms of the damage or failure mode that we see with pre-ignition because I, I think there's a crossover here where 
pre-ignition is maybe quite often confused or misdiagnosed as NOC. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's not easy to know if you actually have super NOC or pre-ignition induced NOC or normal NOC. But let's say many times when you have super NOC, the damage is mechanical unless let's say the power level that you are running is not very high for the components that you are using but let's say i can give you let's say some examples i've seen engines where let's say the average cylinder pressure at high load so at full throttle uh, high rpm was let's say close to 100 bars and the super knock events were almost at 300 bars so it's a very, 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 very big increase uh, in cylinder pressure. In that case, what happened was that the piston would crack in two. So you wouldn't get a chance to see any other damage. So, so no, no melting or deformation, just a, a physical break. Yes, yes, because you don't get a lot of these events. Uh, you have the heat-related damages, but they put a lot of mechanical stress on the components. That's for sure. So it's not easy to get super knock on a properly built race engine. The most common way that you can get super knock is uh, at the rev limiter. So the rev limiter strategy plays a big role on if you get super knock or not, because when you have fuel cut, partial fuel cut, ignition cut, many times you have unburned fuel in the intake manifold, intake ports, in the cylinder that can lead to not normal air fuel ratios, temperatures that will cause super knock. So that is one thing that you cannot easily test and tune. So the only real tool to diagnose that is combustion analysis. All right, so there's another bunch of elements I just want to dive into here and unpack a little bit further because uh, it's not not a, a subject we, we get the opportunity to talk about too often. So you previously sort of suggested, if, if I'm following you correctly here, that, that super knock is led on from pre-ignition. So if, if I got that right, so what is going to cause a, let's call it a normal pre-ignition event to, to sort of snowball into super knock versus just being pre-ignition? I, I guess... To put it more clearly, is every pre-ignition event going to become super knock? And if not, what is the difference? It depends on the load on the engine. So if you're running at the part throttle uh, and you have do not have a lot of fuel in the engine, you could call it a normal pre-ignition event and it will probably not do a lot of damage. But if you are at a full load, uh, then most probably a pre-ignition will lead to um, super knock. Okay, okay. That, yep, that's that's good to clarify. The other thing is in terms of, and we're going to get into methods of, of detecting knock as we go through this. So I'm sort of jumping the gun a little bit here, but it, it leads nicely into this conversation. Normal, I call it normal knock, but let's, for the purposes of this conversation, normal knock we can pick up using a knock sensor and all of the other technology that we're going to talk about in a moment because of that ringing or resonance that it, it causes can the same be said for pre-ignition or super knock can we detect those with with normal audio knock detection yes certainly yes and you get an even higher let's say knock sound or uh, you get it or it occupies let's say more position in the spectrum so it's easier to detect but because it is not frequent it's not easy to let's say identify it uh, you might say this is a let's say um, a strong knock event you will not know if it is a super, super knock or not so if you do not read the cylinder pressure you will not know it and the actual defi definition of the super knock event you see how they classify it say the oems how they classify it is it's a knock event where the maximum cylinder pressure exceeds the let's say the normal cylinder pressure by center percentage so at least 100 percent more something like that if you see the combustion pressure then it's evident that it, it starts from pre-ignition because it starts much the combustion starts much earlier and proceeds let's say very fast 
but it's not easy to classify it with the acoustical knock detection. You can detect it, but it's not easy to classify. I, I guess it also comes down to on a very high specific power output engine, super knock is likely to be a tuning ending event, correct? Like you, you may not come back from that. It could be enough to break a piston in half as you previously mentioned. So at that point, knock control knock detection strategies might not be as as relevant. You know, you're gonna know because the engine's gonna have to come off the dyno and get rebuilt. So something went wrong. Yes, I've seen it happen on um, a particular engine a few times until failure. And I've also seen it happen, let's say, once and then you had the failure. So it might not be, let's say, engine life ending with one time. It depends on the engine, let's say, on, on, on all the variables. Uh, you, ca- you cannot know before. But yes, but you cannot use a no control strategy to control it. For sure. And uh, actually, what I mentioned before is that, let's say, most of the times, say at least for racing applications, uh, for racing applications, most of the times it will happen at the rev limiter because of the rev limiter strategy. That's the most common uh, occurrence. Okay, interesting. I mean, I do know that a, a lot of drag racers like to turn off all of the limiters and cuts just to prevent any potential for hanging up on something that could end up potentially doing damage to the engine. So I'm not sure if that's as a relation as it relates to to staying away from causing super knock. But I mean, there are a, a variety of nasties that even an ignition cut, for example, can cause a, a very high specific power outputs and high RPM. But that's probably a topic for another day. All right, let's dive a, a little bit. We actually, we'll come back a, a step because we've sort of got a little bit out of order. So so let's talk about how Plex was founded and the development of Plex. So for those who haven't heard of Plex, maybe give us a, a bit of a, a high-level view, 30,000-foot view of, of what Plex is today, uh, size, location, number of staff. So the company was actually founded in the 2004. Uh, initially, it was a tuning and calibration company. Uh, we had our in-house dyno, and around 2010, uh, we started pivoting into products for motorsport and tuning. So um, what we do today is we say, develop and produce, I can say, two categories of products. One are racing or performance products that are used in the vehicle, uh, for example, dust displays and loggers. And the other categories are the tuning tools. And in this category, we, we have the knock monitor and we also have the combustion analyzer. So these are the two directions that we currently have. In the future, we might be going into, let's say, also other directions. For example, um, engine control or auxiliary devices. But uh, I'm, I'm not really sure at this point, say, how far in the, the future it might come. I was actually going to ask you when you were talking about how you developed your own uh, injector controller and you mentioned how sort of you had a 3D map that was basically like a mini ECU. I mean, it couldn't have been at that point a, a big stretch to, to actually turn that into a fully fledged ECU. Was was that on your, your radar back at that time or was it just too big a, a task to, to undergo? Yes, it was, and I actually had started developing something like that, but then business was more focused on calibration, where this was put in in the freezer. Uh, Let's say at this time today, it looks like the ECU market is, you could say, saturated. So there are many options. It's not easy to say that there's something missing or there's a gap. So entering such a market is not, at least business-wise, it, it, it might not be um, an easy decision, but uh, we will see what, what happens in, in, in the future. I mean, it's interesting you say that because I would, on face value, have agreed with you. And I, I do remember when Scott Kona released the first Mtron, and I thought at the time, that's quite brave, you know, based in Australia, which for some reason has always been a hotbed of aftermarket ECUs and coming into what at that point, you know, the Mtron is a 
it's not a new product at this point, but even at the time, it was a fairly mature market with a lot of big players that were well established. So yeah, I thought at the time, that's a, a bold move. And it has proven on face value from what I see on the outside, you know, the, the product has actually found a, a place in the market that kind of fits a, a purpose and it seems to be, be thriving. So, I mean, never say never, but yeah, I don't know if it would be, I don't know if it would be a low hanging fruit right now. Yes, it's, it's not a, it's not a low hanging fruit. And the case that you mentioned with Mtron is a little different because there was a background in issue development. So it, it is a little different from us, let's say, going into this area um, at this moment. Definitely. All right, well, let's talk about what you are doing. And the, the product that I really wanted to dive into, which segues nicely from our chat about NOC, is, is your NOC monitor. And I mean, I've been a very strong uh, advocate for audio knock detection through my whole career. I got onto it very, very early and I've used a variety of different products and, and it's always been something that basically any car that I'm tuning on a dyno, I'm going to take the time and, and put audio knock detection on it so I can audibly listen to the engine and I, I can clarify whether it's running normally or whether we're getting into knock. So let's sort of talk a little bit about knock detection and what we're really doing here is relying on a technology that, that's centered around the knock sensor. So talk, talk to us about that sensor. What is it and, and how does it work? What is its output to us? Okay, so the knock sensor is piezoelectric accelerometer, you can say. That's what it is, not you can say. It acts like a microphone, so it detects vibrations on the engine and it converts this to a voltage in a similar way that you have a microphone. So it's a um, microphone specific for say, automotive or industrial applications. So these are, these are bolted to the engine block and basically they are exposed to the normal and abnormal vibrations that the engine block is exposed to and they're then turning that vibration, the frequency and the amplitude of those vibrations into a voltage related to the frequency and amplitude is, is that about right they convert the actual let's say sound or vibration of the engine into a voltage this contains all the uh, information about the amplitude and the free and the various frequencies in the past there were some cases where oems would use this kind of knock sensors that were tuned for a specific frequency so they were kind of the, the output was kind of filtered so that it would output a larger amplitude if the engine for, uh, the noise from the engine was at the frequency the sensor was tuned at. I think today almost all sensors are wideband, so they are similar to a microphone, and then the ECU has the job of detecting the various frequencies. This gives more flexibility, uh, of course, and you only you only need a single part for all engines you don't need to make a different part for each particular engine right so you, you just mentioned about a sensor that's tuned for a given frequency and let's sort of clarify why that's useful and why now that's done by the ecu or the digital so signal processor so i mean the engine mechanically it, it's a really noisy environment you've got lots of noise occurring and these noises occur at a variety of different frequencies but then knock at least as i understand it is generally going to occur at quite a specific frequency and it, it, again at least as, as i've sort of led to believe the frequency that knock will occur is, is very tightly linked to the diameter of the cylinder is, is that correct for a start just that element yes so what, what happens when you have a knock is because you have this very fast combustion the fast pressure rise uh, initiates a pressure wave in the combustion chamber. So this pressure wave, you can call it a sound wave, travels through the combustion chamber until it dissipates. As it hits the combustion chamber walls, it travels back and forth. So the larger dimension of the combustion chamber, which happens to be the bore, is what determines how fast this wave travels back and forth uh, along the combustion chamber. So that is why the knock frequency is correlated to the engine bore size. Of course, it's not exact because it is not an ideal situation. 
where you have um, a perfect uh, cylinder or let's say the perfect shape to have the expected uh, resonant frequency depending on the shape dimensions. The piston is moving at the same time. The combustion chamber temperature also affects the speed of sound, which also affects the frequency. The actual knock frequency is close to this ideal number that we can be calculated from the bore size but it, it is not always exact and it's not always stable. When this resonance starts, you have also different modes of resonance that are happening in the combustion chamber. You have, let's say, a radial uh, resonance that uh, you have a resonance on the y-axis, you can call, it, of the combustion chamber. So you have a lot of resonances happening, at, a lot of modes of this resonance happening at the same time. And this is why when you have knock, you can detect it using the main resonance frequency, and you can also detect it using uh, the other harmonic resonance frequencies. Of course, the strongest resonance is the main one, and this is what gets you the largest sound or amplitude. This is what we hear mostly, but in some cases, we can talk about it later, it is beneficial to also look at the other resonance modes and other frequencies. I just wanted to take a moment out of our chat with Yanis and talk about a package of courses that I think you'll really enjoy and will be really beneficial if you want to expand your knowledge when it comes to EFI tuning and that is our tuning starter package. Essentially this package includes everything that you'll need to know if you want to go from zero to professional tuner as quickly as possible. We start with our EFI tuning fundamentals course which covers the core tuning principles and techniques that you're going to need to understand irrespective of the type of engine you're tuning and irrespective whether you're using an aftermarket standalone ECU or perhaps you're tuning using the factory fitted ECU that came equipped in your car using the technique of reflashing. Moving on we're also including our practical tuning courses you can actually choose here between our practical standalone course or our practical reflash tuning course. Standalone, perfect for those of you tuning aftermarket standalone ECUs. The reflash, of course, perfect for those of you who want to reflash the factory ECU. Uh, this takes you through the process of tuning and breaks the entire tuning process down into a simple step-by-step -step process. And we've got a step-by-step -step process for each of those, irrespective of what you're personally interested in. This means it doesn't matter what particular ECU or reflashing package you are using the principles remain the same the steps remain the same and in no time you've got a properly tuned engine that's delivering great power great torque and great reliability we've also got a library of worked examples included in both of those courses which is where you can watch the step-by-step -step process being applied from start to finish on a real tuning job here we vary both the type of engine and vehicle that we're tuning as well as the type of ECU or tuning platform we're using to give you experience on a wide range of different platforms. We do also add to that library of worked examples from time to time. Once you've purchased the course you get access to any future worked examples at no additional cost. This package also includes our Understanding Air Fuel Ratio course and in my opinion this is probably one of the most misunderstood topics in the world of EFI tuning. You'll learn how the air fuel ratio affects the way the engine operates. You'll learn some safe starting air fuel ratios for a range of different engine types so you can get your engine up and running with no danger. From there we'll also show you how to test and find the optimal air fuel ratio for your engine and your application. We're also including 24 months of gold membership which is access to our private members only webinars which we hold every two weeks. You'll also get access to our back catalogue of webinars. We've got over 300 hours of content in there. It is an absolute gold mine. You'll also get access to our private members only forum which is the best place to get reliable and trustworthy answers to your specific questions. That entire package is usually 417 US dollars. You can use the coupon code PLEX25, P-L-E-X-25. That'll get you 25% off making it just $312.75. As with all of our courses, we still offer a 60 day, no questions asked money back guarantee. So zero risk getting involved. If you don't like it, let us know. We'll give you a full refund of the purchase price. And as usual, we'll put a link to the coupon code and the package in the show notes. Let's get back to our interview now. So again, a bunch of stuff we can dive back into here. So we will actually put a, a note in the show notes with the calculation 
based on bore diameter that, that you can use at home to kind of figure out what that base frequency is, is likely to be. As you mentioned, I mean, it is just a, a calculation. It'll get you in the ballpark, but some specifics might mean that the, the actual frequency is going to be a little bit outside of that. Now, you've got knock occurring at a given frequency. Let, let's say, just to put a number out there, it's at 7 kilohertz. My lack of acoustic engineering and electronics prowess would suggest, well, surely this is simple then. All we do is strip away all of the frequencies of noise that are occurring from that knock sensor that aren't at 7 kilohertz, and we only allow through 7 kilohertz, and then if we get any noise, it, it's knock. So, I mean, I, I know that is a very layman sort of perspective on it, but tell me where that logic falls over. Why does that not work? It doesn't fall over, so this is what basically what you need to do. You need to ignore other frequencies, and then you also need to determine what is the normal level of, let's say, amplitude uh, at this selected frequency. Of course, the engine is going to have noise at this frequency, even without knock. You will get some noise in this frequency with none, some knock. So the normal, the normal background noise profile of the engine will still occur. There will be some normal mechanical noise occurring at that same 7 kilohertz that knock we know is also occurring at. That's what you're saying? Yes, you will not have zero noise. So the process that you typically follow is monitor the noise at the selected frequency across the rev range of the engine using safe ignition timing settings or safe boost levels that you know or are pretty sure are not going to cause detonation. And then this gives you a background level that you can use to set a threshold. Let's say you can say some percent points higher. And then you can know if you have an increase in this energy level at this frequency below your th above your threshold, uh, you can, uh, let's say, safely assume that it is not. And depending on how strong this increase will be, you can also classify knock if it is light knock or heavy knock. This is the, let's say, the basic principle that all ECU knock detection systems use our devices use. So there are many let's say, details that you have to apply around this strategy to make it more effective, but, but this is the base of it. And if you understand this, you are... Uh, let's say in a good starting position to be able to um, to detect knock. For more advanced, you want to go into more advanced, let's say knock detection modes, or what you, you could do to be able to detect it more effectively. There are various things that you can do. For example, one thing is to listen for knock only at the time period where you expect to have knock. So uh, if you know the position of the engine. You can look for knock only, let's say, for example, from top dead center and for a certain amount of degrees after top dead center. What this will do is you can, let's say, easily ignore sounds that might be at the knock frequency that are outside these periods where you expect knock to happen. So you're essentially just finding ways to improve the signal to noise ratio, making it easier to discern knock from that, that typical background engine noise that's always going to be there. Yes, that's correct. That's what you're trying to do. Just coming back to the, you, you mentioned the second and third order harmonic frequencies. So let's dive into that a little bit because I find that I couldn't say always, but most often when I'm setting up audio knock detection in an, sorry, knock control strategies in an ECU, which as you mentioned, basically is using the same technology. I will typically find I get better results if I'm using the uh, second order frequency, which for those who haven't kind of picked up what we're putting down here, that's simply double the, the base frequency. So we used the example of seven kilohertz before the second order harmonic will simply be double seven, of course, 14 kilohertz. So as you mentioned, the amplitude of the signal drops down but I tend to find that that again gives me a improvement in the, the signal to noise ratio. Does that sort of fit with your experience and, and have you got some feedback on, on why we may get a, a better result at that second order frequency? Yes, so what happens is the following. 
the base knock frequencies that we typically have on engines that we usually tune are, you can say around, let's say, 6 kilohertz, maybe to 8 kilohertz. So in this frequency range, you can easily have noise sounds from the engines from the mechanical components. So the background engine noise at these frequencies is usually quite high. At the higher harmonic frequencies, it is more difficult to have background engine noise from the mechanical sounds in the engine. Let's say when you hit two metals together, it is difficult to get a sound that is 14 kilohertz or 16 kilohertz or in, in that range. It's much more difficult than to get a sound at 6 and 7 kilohertz. So you end up with a better signal to noise ratio, which makes knock detection easier. The harmonic frequencies are, so the second harmonic, uh, as you said, is not exactly double the frequency because you are detecting a different resonance mode. And this also depends on the shape of the combustion chamber. It is close to double, but it's usually not exactly double. A strategy that OEMEC is used is to look at multiple frequencies at the same time. We also have this strategy in, as a capability in the new NOC monitor. And this might give you an even higher signal to noise ratio. I, I did actually find MoTeC on the M1 series offer the ability to monitor four different frequencies simultaneously and use one or all of them for the knock control. And uh, I, I have had a bit of experience on the FA20 from the Subaru BRZ Toyota 86 with, with that strategy. And interestingly, I found on the FA20 being a horizontally opposed boxer with two knock sensors that I actually ended up using uh, a marginally different frequency from one bank of cylinders to the other and uh, that actually improved the overall signal to noise. I mean, I, I think the takeaway from this conversation is that this is maybe not set in stone black and white. There's some guidelines or rules of thumbs that we can use to figure out what the frequency is probably going to be, or at least the ballpark that the frequency is going to be in. But beyond that, some testing and fine tuning is going to be required to just find what in fact for a given engine is going to give you the the best ability to detect knock is that is that fair yes that's correct and there are also other issues that are difficult to predict for example how the sound propagates along the engine until it reaches the, the knock sensor so you can have effects there that amplify or let's say reduce levels at certain frequencies so that's difficult to predict. The, the OEMs do a lot of testing and development to find the optimal sensor positions. Uh, we don't usually have that uh, luxury. But uh, this is why what we just mentioned is uh, the strategy we suggest uh, when using our NOC monitor is to, let's say, get some data with safe settings. Then, if possible, force the engine to knock. Uh, you can do this reliably and without danger on a dyno if you understand what you're doing and then examine the data that you have recorded using the spectrum analysis that we have in the software to determine what the actual knock frequencies are and then uh, change your configuration so that it uh, uses let's say the best frequency for detection. So you can really zero in on exactly where that frequency is occurring. Yes, another capability that we have added for this is that sometimes because you might not uh, be able to test again with a different frequency, you can use the software because the software contains all the data, not only the filtered data uh, from the NOC sensor to recalculate the NOC levels at a new frequency. And you can also do comparisons and try to figure out which frequency is best, let's say, even for different type of conditions. All right. Outside of your, your specific knock monitor software, there's a technology available. I've, I've done this with various ECUs which require a third-party piece of software. I want to say it's called Goldwave, but don't, don't quote me on that. But essentially yes, what yes, you would that, do that, is, that's one of is them. force... Yes. Yeah, so you'd, you'd force the engine to undergo light knock, and I'll get into that in a moment because a few people are probably scared about what I just mentioned. And you'd record that just as an audio sample, feed that into Goldwave, and then that's just an audio processing software 
package essentially for want of a better term and uh, then you'd perform if my memory serves correct a fast Fourier transform on it which basically takes that sample from the time domain into the frequency domain if I've got my technology my, my terminology right and then you basically can see exactly where the, the knock was occurring sort of you get a, a colored sort of output and you can see the intensity based on the color and then you know where that knock was occurring you can see exactly what the frequency was so yeah I just wanted to mention that that this is a, a pretty well developed technology for analyzing things like this so you can can really zero in on exactly rather than relying on calculations and maybes and what ifs you know all right so once you've got this set up you've also got the ability on your knock monitor in terms of the audio input that the the tuner can actually listen to so you've got two elements for this you've got a graphical output and you've also got audio output that the tuner can listen to you've got the ability to run a, a bunch of filter options for the audio the tuner is listening to how does how does that work and again is it a case of testing each of the different options in terms of filtering to, to find what works best for a given engine or is this sort of a go-to this is the first one you try this should work otherwise do this this and this yes what you would typically do is let's say initially select an audio filter frequency for the headphones that is say identical to the knock detection frequency that you are using Usually, at least on our products, the audio filters, so the audio output filters are more wider than the actual detection filters that are used for, let's say, the calculations that produce the knock detection values. This means that you will, let's say, when you select a filter for the audio output, uh, let's say if you select 7 kilohertz, if a knock happens at 6.5 kilohertz, you will still hear it. You will not miss it. The actual, let's say, knock detection algorithm will be much narrower. So if you select 7 kilohertz and knock happens at 6.5, you will lose a lot of uh, detection range. So it might be detected, but it will be the amplitude that you will detect will be much lower. So the filters are narrower th that used there, which end up giving you more precision, but only after you have set it up correctly. Yeah, so it, it really is a case of garbage in, garbage out. You, you've got to have it dialed in to suit, otherwise you're not going to get the best results out of it. Yes. Okay. This technology, sorry, this this product category, I suppose, is, is definitely not new. I, I've been using, as I mentioned, audio knock detection for a long time, and there's a variety of players in this game. Where I see the Plex knock monitor, and, and I'll admit at this stage we've got one of your new version 3 units sitting in our workshop but I haven't had the the chance to use it. Uh, I'm well versed with your previous version 2 product though so I, I, I know it pretty well and you know, you've gone a little further with the version 3. This is not a case of just putting a knock sensor on your engine, plugging it in and, and you're, you're good to go to listen to knock like a lot of the other products that I have used you've got the ability to do some pretty sophisticated things such as individual cylinder knock detection windowing which you mentioned there looking at the signal only in the window of crankshaft rotation where knock is likely to occur and, and a bunch of other things like that as well as inputs and outputs so what's actually required from the tuner in order to get this unit up and running the way that we have designed the device is to be let's say a versatile tool so you can start from just using one knock sensor on the engine and connecting nothing else and be able to do knock detection with that and you can make it as sophisticated as connecting to the drug trigger sensor setting up the um, trigger pattern like you would in the ECU, uh, connecting it to an ECU canvas output, and then recording all the data together to do per cylinder knock detection and ECU data analysis at the same time. So you can do it as simple or as complex as the, let's say, situation you are facing with requires. It's a, it's the as a product. It's like a combination of let's say one of our dust displays, which is fully configurable uh, display pages, uh, fully configurable canvas input, the knock detection part, the trigger crank trigger decoding part that we've taken from our combustion analyzer, and we've combined all this in one product uh, to be used as a tool to mostly assist in knock detection. 
but it can assist, let's say, in more generic engine development work as well. Yeah. I mean, I think it's good that you expanded on that and, and mentioned engine development. So, I mean, coming from a background where I ran a, a professional tuning workshop, it, it's always a balance of the results versus the time spent getting the results. And, you know, for garden variety tuning jobs, you're often time poor. So I don't know if specifically, particularly on a, a garden variety, relatively low powered street car that we're not going to be pushing to the limits, maybe that wouldn't justify the requirement to hook up all those additional sensors and maybe you want to use just a very basic connection for audio only. However, if you're starting to get into a much more involved project, particularly where the dollar value is starting to creep up and protecting the engine and making sure it's tuned to, to perfection and getting every last horsepower out of it without knock occurring, obviously at that point, you know, a, a little bit of additional time spent connecting to things like the, the trigger inputs, that could be justified. So you've got that flexibility to go either way, as little or as much as the tuner wants. Is that what I'm sort of picking up from this? Yes, that is correct. For, let's say, the cook job that you just mentioned, let's say, the, the, the quickest setup that you could do would be, let's say, if it is a type of car that you are working with, let's say, regularly, you can have prepared a small adapter so that you can connect the knock monitor in parallel to the stock knock sensor without even having to install a knock sensor. So you'll just plug it, uh, let's say, in parallel with a knock sensor that is connected to the ECU. And at the same time, you could also have an OBD plug. So you could just connect these two plugs and then uh, instantly you have uh, knock data and you also have some engine data as well. And you can use it just to monitor the audio on the headphones, but at the same time record and if you want to go back and review something in more detail, you can easily do that. That is a very, very quick setup. I mean, definitely, it's not a lot of work to make up what you've just mentioned there. Uh, it's interesting using the or sharing that signal from the factory knock sensor. I'm taking it that that has no negative impacts on the signal that the factory ECU or the ECU is still receiving that can happily share. Yes, you can share it. We have designed it in, in a way that you can share the signal without affecting it, the uh, ECU knock uh, detection performance. Okay. I'm just interested as well in terms of the the knock sensor placement. You you alluded to that earlier that the the OEs sort of have the flexibility of placing these sensors where they want. This has always been a bit of a problem, I think, in the aftermarket, particularly as engine bays have become more crammed and there's less space to work with. You know, generally you're trying to find a, an unused threaded boss somewhere on the engine block that you can add your additional sensor to. You know, the, the general rule of thumb has always been that the knock sensor should be located somewhere up high on the engine block near the deck surface where the head bolt's on, but of course that's not always practical. Sometimes you end up down near the sump rails or, you know, Worst case scenario, I've, I've actually had reasonable results in some engines with the knock sensor placed on the inlet manifold, obviously not ideal, but you know, it, sometimes when needs must, some engines don't have any spare bosses that you can use or the M14, which doesn't work nicely with a, a knock sensor. What's your sort of guide on, on where you want to try and fit the knock sensor if possible and, and what are the areas to stay away from? So the first place, the first choice, of course, would be high on the engine block, say similar to the stock sensor position. Uh, one technique that you can use if you have a room that works is you can use a longer bolt and put the knock sensor on top of the existing knock sensor. So you can make a sandwich of two knock sensor. This works well without any side effects if it is you, you have the correct bolt and you torque it down correctly because the um, uh, knock sensors uh, are touching on flat surfaces and they are, let's say, square to one another, so they become like one body. At least then you also know that you're replicating that factory knock sensor location, so you've got a, as ideal location as you can, you can really get to, correct? Yes. If that's not possible... Then, as you said, sometimes it is better to go higher than lower. So going down towards the sump usually does not produce good results. 
but uh, many times the cylinder head or the intake manifold can produce quite good results. But you have to test it first to make sure that it works. You cannot expect it to work uh, in all cases. Yeah. I've found some instances where I think I'd probably put it down to valve train noise and uh, particularly a, a mechanical uh, or a solid cam valve train where there's no hydraulic lash adjuster to sort of take up that lash clearance you know that those tend to be mechanically a lot more noisy and i think on on that style of engine you're often at least in my experience I, I i tend to get worse results being cylinder head or inlet manifold but on a hydraulic valve train usually they're a lot quieter so that actually tends to work pretty well coming back to i, I made a point before about creating knock purposely and I just wanted to touch on that because you know we, we talk about the dangers of knock and, and how we want to avoid it at all costs but then counterintuitively we're also saying that some of the time to validate the, the knock detection strategy particularly in an ECU you, you actually need to generate some some knock and also for those getting started with tuning you know using audio knock detection equipment is great but it's it's only useful if you know what knock sounds like so you do actually need to experience some knock and again that sounds quite scary but as you mentioned you know you can generate this in a relatively safe environment I always like to do this on the dyno but I generally will try and do it at relatively low RPM somewhere around about maybe three three and a half thousand RPM and what I'll do is sort of bring the engine into moderate load if it's turbocharged you know just a, a small amount of boost is, is a good place to do it because you're not overly stressing the engine the specific power levels aren't huge so a, a little bit of light knock for a brief period is, is very unlikely to do any damage and uh, what I'll do is select a timing cell at a load site above where I'm running and uh, maybe I'll add 10 or 12 degrees to it so I know that it's going to be definitely high enough to cause some knock and then I'll just cycle the using the throttle like move up into that load zone just briefly enough to to generate a little bit of knock maybe you'll get a two or three clicks of knock and then pull it back down so you're not sitting there sustaining knock it's only very very brief but it allows you to audibly listen to it audibly understand it and do all of the other validation tasks uh, that are needed. I think where knock becomes dangerous is sustained knock under high RPM and very high load. Uh, that that's where the the damage is going to happen and happen faster. Again, does this sort of you know what I'm saying here match your experience? Yes, yes, that that's a nice process to use. An alternative that I would also suggest is instead of using steady state. If you maybe you don't have the capability to do steady state or you are at the road and you're doing a sweep test or ramp, you can add ignition timing only to one say, RPM column in your ignition map. So when the engine accelerates through that RPM point, it will briefly get this advanced ignition timing, but then you're certain that as it passes this RPM point, the ignition timing will go back down. Uh, this is another way to ensure that knock will only be happening for a cycle or a few cycles uh, because something that that's something that I, we didn't mention before is people don't don't understand the following uh, many times is that if you look at the combustion pressure or how combustion happens on gasoline engine it is not very stable so you have a lot of combustion variability from cycle to cycle what this means is that the conditions for knock to happen are not correct for, on every cycle. So you might have the correct conditions on one cycle, and then even with the same ignition timing, the same boost, the same RPM, you might get knock only 10 cycles after that. This is because of the, let's say, the um, erratic nature of the gasoline and air fuel burn, and also the variability in the... Um, uh, distribution distribution of the air fuel mixture inside the engine so it's not a predictable process but this helps us because it means that it's not easy to get into continuous knock yeah okay so i mean i think most people would think that every engine cycle occurs exactly the same as the one previous but it's, it's quite chaotic and quite erratic Yes, that's uh, what really happens. And this helps. You can uh, initiate knock and have a high degree of probability that it will not be continuous. Yeah, okay. No, that makes sense. 
Now, I think at this point, probably a, a bunch of our listeners are also sort of thinking to themselves, well, this conversation is all well and good, but uh, what the hell does knock actually sound like? And I mean, I know that the last time we spoke, you actually had some audio samples on your website that indicated what knock sounds like. Is that still the case? Can we point people at, at that? I'm not sure that we have them, but in the new data analysis software for the knock monitor, it's not currently that, but we will add some sample files where somebody can download the software, open the files to review them, and also play back the audio. Okay, okay. So you can listen to the audio and also see the data at the same time. Right, well, our, our producer can do a little bit of digging before the show is and, and find some samples. Uh, alternatively, we've also got a, a YouTube video that, that we produced a very, very long time ago uh, that centers around Knock, and that has some audio in it too. All right, uh, in terms of sort of coming back to, to our Knock sensor location, another question, I mean, I know your Knock monitor can take one or two Knock sensors. On, on a V configuration engine, it, it's pretty t- typical for OEs to fit one sensor per bank of cylinders, which obviously makes makes a lot of sense. Likewise, I see on inline six cylinder engines, it's quite common to have a sensor located nearer to the front and nearer to the rear. How, how essential is that? I mean, the, the resonance that occurs is going to pass through the whole block. Can we get away with one sensor or is more simply better? I would say that on a V engine, you should certainly use two sensors. Maybe one sensor will work as a last resort if you have an intake manifold and you bolt it on the intake manifold between the two banks of the engine, but I would suggest two sensors. On an inline engine, I would suggest one sensor works well, up to four cylinders. You will get some results with six cylinders, but it's preferred to use two sensors with six, six cylinders because there is some dispersion of the sound say going through the engine block and if you do not use say, multiple sensors you will need to work on uh, adjusting per cylinder gain this might mean that you need to set up the device installation so that you can do per cylinder detection so it becomes a little more complicated and it's better to start with the two knock sensors if you have more cylinders say more than five cylinders okay I think we've just sort of opened another whole can of worms, but I think it's probably worth diving into a little bit. So this this term you've mentioned there, uh, per cylinder gain, I think if we look at the way knock detection strategies work in ECUs, aftermarket ECUs in general, because as you mentioned, the technology is essentially the same as what you've incorporated in your knock monitor. And I saw this kind of develop initially the knock detection strategy was just an overall it's looking for the output from the knock sensor does it exceed the knock threshold if it does knocks occurring and then timing would be retarded typically on all of the cylinders be it four six or or whatever we've got and then things got a little bit more complicated and i think the ecu manufacturers figured well actually not only are we monitoring the output from the knock sensor but we know obviously what cylinder is actually firing at any particular point in time so if we know this uh, we know when the knock occurred we can actually tie that into the particular cylinder so then we got into this point of monitoring uh, knock per cylinder and and quickly i think that found the ability to extract just that little bit of extra power when we actually started realizing that particular engines would be more prone to knocking on maybe one or two cylinders so if you wanted to get really granular with this stuff you could actually start dialing in another couple of degrees on maybe cylinders one and four and knowing full well that two and three were the ones that were more knock prone and if you want to get that right you really have to have your gain set correctly per cylinder so that you can be pretty confident that when you get a knock event or something exceeding the knock threshold that that was actual knock and not just a an, an idiosyncrasy because of the knock sensor location versus the cylinder that's firing so lots of information there but your knock monitor also has the same ability to do per cylinder gain so you actually know when a particular cylinder, cylinder is knocking correct Yes, the per cylinder gain is used to, let's say, equalize the levels of sound that are coming from the different cylinders because the knock sensor is not positioned in an equal distance to all cylinders. So that's what you use the per cylinder gain. 
to do per-cylinder detection, as a minimum, you need the ignition trigger signal from cylinder one, and then you can tell the device what's the firing order of the engine, and the device then will divide the time between this, the one firing and the next firing say into equal parts and assign the correct cylinder to them so that it knows when it detects noke in one uh, section of time, it is from that particular cylinder. This is the, the simplest method and requires an ignition trigger signal. You can also use a crank trigger signal, crank and cam up trigger signal like uh, in an ECU. This requires a little more setup. You have to set up the trigger pattern, uh, calibrate the um, uh, trigger offset correctly, and then you can do per cylinder detection again. And in this mode, you can also do, let's say, um, windowing function where you can use even less time than this, let's say, cycle uh, time uh, difference divided by the number of cylinders and only listen for a particular cylinder for a section of the crank engine position uh, uh, revolution. Okay. Yeah, and obviously some really advanced functionality if you want to start layering in just a little bit more complexity on the initial setup and, and connection. I mean, I'm guessing particularly for tuners out there though who are focusing on a fairly narrow range of, of engines, yeah, it's it's not going to be too difficult to develop some sort of pigtail adapters to to make this installation relatively quick and easy. Correct? Yes, you you can connect in parallel to the sensors with the ECU without affecting them. So in, installation, the effort depends on preparation and the particular application. So it might be as easy as plugging in the adapter for the at the crank sensor connector that you have already built. Uh, in in one minute you might need to splice wires near the ecu it depends now moving on a little bit I, i'm just sort of interested in other knock detection technologies that are out there as i've sort of seen it and what i've been exposed to is almost solely and exclusively been around the bosch donut style piezoelectric knock sensor that we've been discussing I've heard on on sort of various points through my career about uh, OEs using different technology. One of those being, I think it's uh, ion sensing knock detection, which as I understand it is sort of passing a voltage back through the spark plug after the combustion started and detecting something from that that is affected by, by knock. So you know, is this viable? I, I personally haven't come across OEs using it, but I, I am aware that I'm not exposed to a, a lot of European vehicles. So what can you tell us about that technology? Yes, this technology was invented, I think, by Saab, so this the Swedish car company, and they used it in their turbocharged engines, maybe starting from the 80s. At that point, probably it, it was working better than the knock sensor knock detection. I think in more, let's say, modern times, uh, I've seen some uh, BMW cars, maybe also some Suzuki cars that use it. What they actually do is the following. When you have a normal combustion, let's say you have normal combustion propagation and speed, and the gases are not ionized, so uh, the pressure and the heat is not high enough to create ions in the um, molecules of the combustion. So when knock happens because of the extreme speed, pressure, and heat, you get more ions produced in the um, combustion gases. Uh, after the spark plug fires, say at some time point after that, a voltage, a high voltage is applied to the spark plug. An electronic device measures the current that can pass through the combustion gases between the spark plug electrodes. So this, car, this current is proportional to the ionization level of the gases. And it happens that when you have knock, you have a much higher ionization level. By classifying this value, they can determine if knock happened or not on a per cycle basis. And uh, the benefit of this technology is that it is not affected by all the mechanical engine noises and after that, but it is affected by the, the condition of the spark plugs. Ah, I just remember that Ferrari also uses this technology in some of their cars. Well, it's not working with the F1 cars, is it? 
<laughs> I don't think they're using it there. But on the road cars, I know that they, let's say, from um, talking to some, uh, let's say, workshop owners that work with Ferraris, that uh, these systems are very particular in the type of spark plug that is used and also the condition of the spark plugs. So there are limitations. This is why probably not everybody has adopted this technology. Yeah, I, I usually in the OE world, I, I sort of, my expectation is that if there's two technologies and one is a clear winner, everyone kind of reasonably quickly migrates across to it. So the fact that at least the majority, as I see it, are still dealing with the good old fashioned piezoelectric knock sensor suggests that that's become a winning technology. I guess at the, at the top of the, the heap though, and a lot more money and a lot more uh, work involved in fitment uh, would be in cylinder pressure detection or pressure monitoring. So you can actually see, I mean, you've already mentioned that even that's maybe not a always black and white in terms of when knocks occurring, but at least then you know exactly what, what is happening in terms of that pressure trace, correct? Yes. So if you monitor the combustion pressure inside the cylinder, you can, uh, let's say, more easily detect knock visually if you have the graph in front of you or using various, let's say, calculated metrics. This works really well for let's say, race engine development at a higher level and is the tool that is used by the OEMs when they calibrate the knock sensor based detection systems. So they use this kind of uh, tool as a reference. But still, it's not, let's say, 100% clear when you are measuring combustion uh, pressure, if you have a knock or not, especially if we are talking about a light knock. Uh, this happens because, again, combustion is not a very predictable event. And even in normal combustion, you can have some resonance in the combustion chamber. There are also issues that have to do with the installation of the sensors. And if the sensors are installed in a way that you cannot have, a, let's say, fake resonances created in the passages of the pressure. For example, it is critical that the combustion pressure sensor is placed very close or almost flush with the combustion chamber. If you place it a little further away and have a, a passage, even a short passage, like a 10 millimeter long passage for the pressure, it might cause a resonance artifacts in the signal that look like knock but are not knock. Okay. So essentially, no matter which way we slice it, you're going to have some problems to deal with in terms of knock detection and even in cylinder pressure monitoring has its own set of issues to overcome, not, not least of which is the cost of, of entry, of course. Yes, yes. Th there are some obstacles that you need to um, overcome and some work to do until you, be, you will be able to classify it because you have to find a way that you can determine uh, what is knock and say what is strong knock, how much knock is tolerable, and uh, this uh, requires say, work yeah. for sure. Okay. I mean, on that last point you just made, how much knock is tolerable, it, it, again, for, for those listening who at this stage are, are probably terrified by the prospect of absolutely any level of, of knock, I mean, we need to break that down because it's, it's not always the case. I mean, probably everyone's heard, you know, a, an old Toyota Corolla, well, at least on this side of the world, an old Toyota Corolla laboring up a steep hill in, in top gear at 2000 RPM and, and the things audibly from the outside of the car knocking its head off. But chances are, because of the low specific power level, the low RPM and the relatively low load, that could do another 100,000 kilometres with, with no noticeable downsides to engine life. But then you take a high output turbocharged drag engine, and as we mentioned earlier, you know, only a handful of, of knock cycles can be enough to do damage. So where's the, the sort of happy point in there? Uh, do we want to avoid any potential knock at all, what is tolerable, what's not? It's not easy to say what's tolerable or not knock. A, a good, let's say, measure is if you can have a runaway knock. So if having some knock can easily cause knock to increase over time, then you cannot tolerate knock because eventually you will go into this situation. If you have an engine and fuel and combustion 
that you can have some knock, but this will not increase into more frequent knock. Let's say even if you continuously load the engine, then this might be okay. And the reason for this is that because combustion is not stable, each combustion cycle will output a different power level. If you average a few combustion cycles, that is the power level you see as the output of the engine. To get maximum power from your average of these few combustion cycles, you might need to push the engine with more timing so that one of or two out of 10 or maybe a higher number cycles get into knock. This will bring the average up and create more power, even though you will have a couple of knock events every few cycles. If it's not very frequent, then the additional heat load on the piston will not cause any damage. And usually the additional pressure when you have knock, it's something that the engine can tolerate. Finding this balance is not easy, especially if you are doing any kind of uh, racing that involves endurance. So it's a, for a long period of time. It requires a lot of testing so that you can uh, determine how much knock you can tolerate. <laughs> It was sort of a trick question because it's not one that you can provide a, an across the board answer for, which I know everyone listening is probably hoping for. Uh, a couple of things I'll, I'll mention is what, what I try and stay away from, and I think it really kind of echoes what you're saying here. I want to stay away from any situation where I can do either a wide open throttle ramp run on the dyno or an acceleration pull on the road or the racetrack and you know, maybe you do 10 pulls in a row and on one or two of them you'll have one or two little clicks of knock occur. Now I want to stay away from a situation where I can repeat that run where I had one or two clicks of, of knock occur. I want to get away from a situation where I repeat that run and it happens again. If it happens again to me that's a problem I'm going to deal with. Probably I'm going to pull a little bit of timing out of those areas where the knock occurred. However, in 10 runs with a well-tuned engine, you might find that in one or two of them randomly, you might have one or two hits of, of knock, and then the other seven or eight runs are, are perfectly clean. Under those conditions, I'm, I'm happy with that. And then I'm also going to be falling back on a well-tuned knock control strategy to pick up the pieces if I'm a little too close to the edge. This also comes into your aims because for a daily driven road car, I don't see the point in tuning the thing on the absolute edge of detonation. You know, the extra three or five or even 10 horsepower that you might get from tuning it on the absolute edge, it, it, you know, most people in a road car, it's not going to matter. So you better to pull a couple more degrees out safe up the tune a little bit and have that confidence that a marginal batch of fuel is not going to be enough to, to put the thing over the edge or maybe uh, ambient conditions are much, much hotter than what you saw when you were tuning it and that's enough to put it over the edge. So that, that's kind of my aim. Whereas obviously for a competition race car, yeah, we're always trying to claw out those extra few horsepower, extra few kilowatts. So you do tend to live a little bit closer to the edge. The other element I'll just bring in here is it's it's often quite an eye opener to see what level of knock OE strategies are prepared to accept. And the two examples I'll give there is just about any turbocharged Subaru, WRX, STI, whatever it might be, 100% stock form, uh, at least the ones that we see here in New Zealand straight off the showroom floor. You put them on a dyno, they will knock and they are reliant on that knock control strategy to pull timing out, which to me has never really been a good way of dealing with it. And exactly the same with some of the GM product, uh, the Gen 4 LS, for example, in stock form, the majority of those that I see in 100% in stock form will also be pretty heavily reliant on the knock control strategy. So I think that the, the takeaway here is understand the implications of knock and how that changes as a specific power level rise rises. So light knock under cruise conditions, you're never going to do any damage or very unlikely, but you know, same conditions at six and a half, seven thousand RPM wide open throttle, and that's where you're going to be doing damage. So that's where you want to stay away from knock. Long winded explanation, but does that sort of match again your your experience? 
Yes, that matches my experience, but it, it's different when you have a uh, stock car, as you said, which relies on the no-control strategy. The OE has spent a lot of hours tuning that strategy, and they know it's going to work, even though they have gotten it wrong in the past, <laughs> which like Subaru <laughs> some years ago, but usually they work fine. But when you start modifying the engine, uh, heavily, then maybe that knock strategy will not work as expected. Sometimes the opposite will happen. It will, uh, let's say, retard the timing too much because it's picking up too much noise from your modified engine. Then people tend to go the other direction. They try to desensitize the ECU by reducing, say, the gain levels of the knock sensors but still not being really sure what ha- what happens. And uh, I, as you said, I would say that in a road car, for a road car application, performance application, I would certainly try to be safe or safer. For a race car where you want performance, but uh, you can push it harder, but there you have different parameters. You might be able to control the fuel, for example, which is very important. It's not the same. And you also meet, might be uh, wanting to tolerate some possibility of failure, if it's going to, let's say, win a race, uh, that's also a possibility. Yeah, again, it, it, there's not a lot of black and white in this discussion. There's just a, a whole bunch of grey in, in understanding the implications of, of your decision when you're tuning, I think, is, is really critical. Because, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you've got a, a world title, world record on the line, then... Um, hey, yeah, maybe financially you're prepared to accept a potential engine failure if it means getting your your title, your world record, your championship or whatever that may be. For others, they may have absolutely no consideration. Like financially, I just couldn't tolerate that. So again, it's just tuning to the to the specific application and, and conditions. So hopefully that's enough information for, for everyone to sort of take out of this. I mean, it, it is a very, very wide topic and I'm sure we could probably go on for another couple of hours and still not uh, essentially touch the sides of it. it. It is so broad, but hopefully the discussion so far has at least expanded knowledge for those who are listening and have made it to this point and are still awake i hope i hope so <laughs> <laughs> all right Giannis, uh because we could go on forever I, I think we will start to wrap this thing up so we're going to ask the same three questions that we ask all of our guests at the end and the first of those is what's next in the future for you and plex tuning we are always working on new products what we're going to release in the following months are a new version of our micro display and a new version of our boost controller. These are going to be, let's say, very different from what we had in the past. So they will be very capable devices. The, the small dashboard will be, let's say, nearly as capable as our larger dashboards with options like built-in GPS, lap timing, performance timing and full data logging uh, in a very small display size that can easily be used in um, stock cars, not as a main dashboard on a race car. And the boost controller is going to be like an add-on module that sits on the engine bay and can uh, be controlled by any of our dashboards. And uh, it will have high-end capabilities like being able to drive multiple solenoids, uh, the new electrical waste gates, uh, even the external electrical waste gates, uh, multiple sensor inputs for thermocouples, additional pressure sensors, turbo speed sensors, and various high-end boost control capabilities. So it's going to be an interesting product. And then we are also working on um, major upgrades to our analysis software packages and a new version of the combustion analyzer. So it's quite a lot, let's say, currently in development. Yeah, it sounds like that would be enough to, to keep you busy without needing to resort to developing an all-new ECU as well. <laughs> no, not at this time. All right, next question, Yanis. Is there any advice you'd give to a younger version of yourself to help reach where you've got to today in your career, maybe a little bit quicker, maybe avoiding some potential pitfalls that you've had along the way? I think two things I could say would be, let's say, challenge myself myself more because through the challenges you build knowledge 
if possible, find a mentor. I'm not really sure that will take you always in the right direction, but it can certainly accelerate things. I think the the mentor comment is one that's been brought up a few times actually on the podcast, and and I absolutely do agree with it. I, I probably wasn't fortunate enough to have someone that I could use as a mentor, but uh, you know, time and time again, I see the the value of that, and not just in the automotive industry, but I mean, just about anything. And there's plenty of of older people out there who are sort of you know, got a, got more knowledge, you know, learned more or forgotten more, I should say, than I know at this point. And, you know, often they are more than too happy to share their passion with someone young and enthusiastic. And, um, yeah, if you can find that right mentor, it can be a, a huge step up in speeding up your career development, I believe. Yes, certainly. Last question for today, if people want to follow you and see what you're up to, how are they best to do so? So we have a Facebook and Instagram web pages where we post some updates, not very frequent. Maybe the best way is to subscribe to our newsletter. You can do that from our website. Uh, this is where we let's see, typically post the updates and news on our products. And they can also easily contact us directly on our email address. We'll put uh, all of those in the show notes as well, make it uh, super easy for people to reach out and, and find you. Oh, well, Janos, it's been a, a great chat as always and you know, really appreciate your time today sort of expanding on and uh, and helping develop a little bit more knowledge around what knock is and, and ways we can understand it and know when it's occurring. So yeah, really, really appreciate everything you've done for us today. And I also look forward to uh, having my opportunity to put the version 3 knock monitor through its paces. So, uh, no doubt there'll be an update on that uh, on our YouTube channel when we do get the chance to do so. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share some knowledge. And if anybody has any additional questions based on what we talked about, I would be happy to answer it through uh, when they contact me through email. Perfect. All right. Thanks again. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this episode of Tuned In with Giannis, we'd love it if you could drop a review on your chosen podcasting platform. These reviews really help us to grow our audience and that, in turn, helps us to continue to get more high quality guests. To say thanks, each week we'll be picking a random reviewer and sending them out an HPA t-shirt free of charge anywhere in the world. This is also a great place to ask any questions you might have, and I'll do my best to answer them if your review gets picked. So this week a big shout out to General J14 from Canada, who has said amazing podcast by far the best podcast i listen to the knowledge you can gain just by listening to these guys is amazing well thanks for the kind words there and if you get in touch with your t-shirt size and shipping details we'll fire a fresh tea off straight out to you all right, that concludes our interview and before we sign off I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialise in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember you've got that coupon code, you can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 75 dollars off the purchase of your first course you'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses important to mention that when you purchase a course from us that course is yours for life as well it never expires you can rewatch the course as many times as you like whenever you like the purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership that gives you access to our private members only forum which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code PODCAST75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.